you know, I feel kind of privileged to talk about the security forces defections and backfire because I was uh, not just involved in one very important uh, episode which I, in my view, uh, forced Milosevic's regime to, to step down and this, was, this wasn't even registered in the movie that we saw yesterday. So what I'm going to uh, share with you is, a, is, a, is one small episode of the struggle which I think uh, made uh, a difference. And it, it, it had to do a lot with backfire. And the second part of the, of the presentation uh, has to do with security forces defections and divisions and defections. And what is uh, interesting there is that on October 5th, when Milosevic fell down, I wasn't actually uh, with the protesters. I was drafted into the Yugoslav army. <laughs> and my job was to defend the regime. And I guess I betrayed my commander in chief because he obviously stepped down. But I had a chance to see from the inside how the process looks like. And how actually the, the, at least in this case, military units decided not to, not to defend the regime in the very last moment. So we're going to, the, the, the format of this is going to be a little bit kind of engaging because we had, you know, uh, lunch and now the food is starting to kick in and the blood is going from the brain down to the stomach. So we have to kind of uh, uh, have a more engaging uh, conversation. So... We're going to talk a little bit about, before we talk about uh, security forces defection, before we talk about uh, backfire, we're going to talk about repression. And we're going to talk about violence as a tool of political coercion that is used by the regime. So here we can see the famous picture of the, of the Tiananmen uh, suppression of the protest in Tiananmen Square, which happened in 1989. And the famous picture is the so-called tank man. It's one guy facing a, a, a number of tanks of the, of the Chinese military. So this is kind of a symbolic uh, picture that, that describes what the repression is all about. And it describes all the might of the repressive apparatus. And it describes you know, how how shall I say, defenseless, uh, a person facing that uh, also looks. But it also shows the defiance of, of that person that is, not, that is still standing there. So let's, let's talk a, lot, a little bit uh, about repression. Let's ask certain questions about repression. For instance, what is the goal of repression from the point of view of the regime? Why uh, regimes use repression? What is the ultimate goal? Any, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. to, instill, to instill fear among people. To instill fear among people. To hold the power. Hold the power. OK. Any other thoughts? To control. To control. Mm -hmm. to maintain order. Maintain order. To force citizens to obey. But in the case of Stalin, for fun. For fun? <laughs> that is also. In the case of Caligula, too. <laughs> Don't credit Stalin for everything. <laughs> Let's ask ourselves another question. <laughs> are, there, are there any limitations to repression? Are there any costs uh, associated uh, with repression that the regime has to think about? It, there, yeah, there is that, there is that uh, limitation. The more repressive the regime, the, the less caring it looks. It's more hostile to its population. Any other limitation? International pressure. International pressure, yes. People, you know, regimes do care about their international standing, some more than the others. Any other? It's cost a lot to put all these tanks and people out there. Exactly. There is a material cost. You know, repression is actually very costly in terms of material resources, but also skill building for, you know, like you have to train people how to repress. It's not, you know, it's not so easy. Uh, and and it, that requires, that's why they have like uh, specialized forces that engage in repression. Yeah, I think after some time it becomes difficult for the regime to use troops against non-resident 
after some time, uh, mm -hmm. it becomes difficult for the people or for the regime to take the security forces to, uh, to use uh, uh, force against people who are non not violent. That, that, is, that is an important justification of repression. And this is something we're going to focus on more later. Mm -hmm. This is like, you know, we had uh, back in the old days under the uh, Tito's, during the good old days of Tito's rule, there was like all, all these dissident writers, they would discuss with the censors the promotion of their new book. Because whenever the, their book is banned, you know, they get much bigger publicity, you know. If they can get into jail, it's even better, you know. <laughs> For the, so, so, yeah, this is like, this is, this is another thing. Nathan, you were... Mm -hmm, like, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like, uh, can you give us uh, like a uh, more like an example or, or like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to kind of see. Aha, aha, aha. So it's kind of you know trying to keep everything, you know, to keep everything in check in in like matters of communication and yeah, 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 yeah. That is also a communication cost between the different parts of the... It's the uh, issue of uh, win and lose. Mm -hmm. if, if there is a not uh, right mix, then it can lose. So that it can cost me for this. So you mean that, you know, r risking, if you kind of uh, threaten something and then that threat doesn't come true, you lose your authority. Yeah, yeah I have to quote a famous uh, 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 character from a comic strip. Corto Maltese by Hugo Pratt, who was a, he was a captain of a pirate ship and he was, you know, uh, a victim of a mutiny, you know. And then, because his uh, sailors rebelled against him and, and when they asked him later how that happened, and he said, you know, you have an authority as long as you don't use it. So he actually tried to use an authority on his crew and they kicked him out overboard. That's true. Yeah, there is this, you know, uh, uh, problem of, 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 you know, failure that, that, that then destroys the credibility of the movement. Let's hear one more and then move. I was going to say a similar thing. They're very clever. They, they're great. But they're great for the leaders and so they get some of the mm, oh, Can you rephrase that? I'm trying to. Yeah, um, I guess a repressive system creates so much frustration and anger, but that that fear lasts only as long as, as, it, as it does, and then when it breaks, it's mm -hmm. It's yeah. not like another system that may be more, influ you know, try to influence people in a different way, mm -hmm. you know, maybe defend you when you mm -hmm. go wrong, but if you're repressing, you know, it, it's very bitter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is this problem of sustainability and saturation, you know, with, you know, you cannot, you cannot shock people all the time with the with with brutality they yeah it, it the, the effects are gone after some time well you know let's 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 spend few minutes like talking about the the effects of repression you know uh, let's you know to go back to I don't want to uh, put that uh, put that picture back but if we look at the if if we look at the uh, that picture from Tiananmen who is the target of that repression the, the student? And is there, is there an indirect target? Students' families. Hmm? Students' families. Students' families, yeah. What are the, you know, the, there is like a direct effect of, of you know, of, of an arrest, of beating, of, of murder, assassination. Direct effect, you assassinate a dissident, he's gone. That's a direct effect. But what would be an indirect effect? Threat to the others, don't try to do this, because if you try to do this, the same thing is going to happen to you. This is an important element of repression, because in the cost-benefit analysis, going back to the limitations and costs, in ideal world for regimes, not ideal world for us, but for, for repressive regimes, in their ideal world, the, the little repressive act will create a huge threat and immobilize the population. This, this is what they would like to, to do. They don't want to have like 
thousands and thousands of people that are subject to repression. What they would ideally have is like one symbolic arrest, assassination, which immobilizes the, the, the rest of the population. So this is the indirect, indirect target. And uh, what about, you know, consequences? There are intended consequences. We talked about them. These are the, the, the goals of repression. But what are the unintended consequences of, of repression? It may cause, yeah, it may cause the, what we're going through, that's backfire. It may cause this outrage, you know, uh, excessive use of force or, you know, unjust uh, act or something like that. It can actually create that unintended. What, what are the other unintended effects? So the delegitimization of the government as a whole, both on international scene. Yeah, yeah, that can also be delegitimization, especially if the government claims one, uh, one uh, sort of behavior. And then, you know, it, it is revealed that, that the behavior is, uh, is totally different. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Protection from the regime, so people who can't, you know, who are consciously stay with the government that associates with that regime. Yeah, there was an excellent example, uh, excellent actually thought. I, there, I have an example, uh, you know, there was a, in the Second World War, the German occupiers were, you know, uh, retaliating uh, one, uh, for one killed German, 100 civilians had to be executed. And one of the German soldiers who was supposed to shoot at uh, a bunch of high school, there were 7,000 high school children that were shot as retaliation. And he stood out, out of the firing squad and he said, I will not do it. And they put him there and shot him. So there is this moral obligation. So even people who, are, who know that they're going to be killed because of that, they, they just can't, can't, can't do it. Any other thoughts? Then people are like, oh, wait, actually, maybe everything is not as clear as we mm -hmm. thought it was. Maybe we had a point after all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, credibility of the movement is sometimes uh, established by, by the opposition to that movement. I mean, Karl Marx put it in the manifesto of the Communist Party. He said that the fact that all the forces in Europe are turned against the communists, that actually legitimizes communism as the ideology. You know? so he, that's the opening sentence of the communist manifesto. So in, in the same sense here, you know, the, the, the fact that the regime is so cracking down on the movement, you know, makes that movement, you know, interesting for, for support. That's actually very important, yeah. Yeah, because, and, and, and this is going to take us to the next, uh, uh, okay, to the next uh, part of the, and I'm going to share with you one, one example of backfire. And this is, you know, how actually a, a single act, uh, a repressive act, can actually turn the population uh, against the regime and actually uh, put the, the basic problem of the regime in the forefront. And so, and to reveal the absurdity of the situation. And so what I'm referring to now is the famous Požarevac incident that, that for some reason is not featured in the documentary Bringing Down the Dictator. But... Uh, you know, uh, when this incident happened, uh, before that, uh, many uh, people were arrested, beaten up. Some, some dissidents who were against the Milosevic, they were even killed, including, uh, uh, you know, the uh, editor of the biggest independent uh, newspaper. Or, you know, there was an assassination attempt on the, on the leader of the biggest opposition party who, uh, for some, you know, he, he was lucky, so he, he survived that. But there was repression, and it was ongoing, and it was happening for, for, for years. But then what happened in Požarevac, which is a town east of Belgrade, like some 100 miles east of Belgrade, this is Milosevic's hometown. And this is the place where Milosevic can walk freely. This was the only place in 
Serbia where he could walk into the street, in the streets. And there was a small Otpor cell that was established in, in this town. Milosevic's son, who is this blonde guy in the forefront on the, on the first picture, uh, uh, Milosevic's son, who is like a, and his gang, they ruled that town. He was so furious that, um, that the Otpor's office was established there, Otpor branch was established there, so he actually took one guy who he assumed was, uh, was Otpor leader, and in the main street in Pozhrevac, he put him in a cafe, and they started intimidating him, and telling him, like, you know, this has to stop, because they, they, were, they saw some graffiti in the, in the, in the, on, the, on the buildings. And so this has, to, this has to stop. You have to kind of stop your activities. When this was happening, three other Otpor activists heard about it, and they came to protect their friend. So they came in the middle of the day, in the main street of that town, and they said, leave this person alone, you know, don't intimidate him. This Milosevic's son and his gang, they stood up and they severely beat up these three people. They were beating them so badly and they left them lying in blood in the middle of the street. Like the whole town was there watching and nobody dared to come over because these, these guys were terrorizing the, 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 the city. So you can see the picture of, of Radoj Kolukovic, who was one of the three people who was, who was, who was uh, beaten up. This picture was taken uh, later. So what happens? They're, they're laying down on the, on the ground. The police comes in and they arrest them. So those people who were lying on the ground. And they, not just that they arrest them, but they later uh, accuse them of the attempted murder. That they attempted to murder uh, the guys who, who beat them up. So what happened? We decided to kind of co totally uh, approach, although there was repression happening uh, before, we decided to, to approach this uh, as a singular example of repressive nature of the regime. And we publicized, and you can see the, the, the poster there with Radoj Kozlukovic's face saying this is the face of Serbia. We publicized this story so broadly and all over the place and we tried to kind of show this is our country. We have a town where Milosevic is from, where his son is actually not subject to any rules or any norms. He can do whatever he wants. He's terrorizing that town. He's beating up people. The police then arrest these people and sends, not just sends them to jail, but also accuses them of... So it's, it's a total manipulation. It's a total abuse of institutions. It's a, you know, total... You know, it's a story of, of how one family actually hijacked the whole country. And the repercussions of that are the safety of, of, of ordinary people. And this had a tremendous, tremendous uh, effect. Later, when, you know, everything was over and when we had access to some correspondence between uh, the different parts of the regime, we saw how many underground defections were happening at the time. Nothing overt, but people were like taking, uh, people who were members of the police, secret police, and different branches, of, they were taking vacations, they were taking sick leaves, they didn't want to be part of that. And, uh, and uh, so this was something that we didn't know at the time. At the time we thought we were, we were facing a, a formidable enemy, but we didn't know that underneath this, this um, uh, incident actually created that. We're going we're gonna to focus more on, on, the, on, the, on the details of that because, uh, you know, the incident alone wouldn't create that. There has to be some strategy around it. And so we're going to focus on that. One, mother, one more thing that I want to I say before we, mo we move to, to the dynamic behind it is that, uh, and we're going to use the, uh, m I'm, we're going to use the uh, model that you had in the E class uh, by Brian, uh, the, the article by Brian Martin and David Hess, uh, which kind of talks about the strategy of the movement, how to use backfire and the strategy of the, of, of the regime, how to use backfire. But uh, when the, the event that you saw in the, in the movie, when Otpor was declared a terrorist organization, was the result of this incident. So the reason why we were declared a terrorist organization is that we raised the issue so high that Milosevic is misusing power, that is, you know, terrorizing ordinary citizens. It's not just him. It's his son that is terrorizing citizens. 
And so the, the issue became so, so divisive that they had to escalate as well and declare as a terrorist organization. So if we look at the, at the backfire dynamic, you know, first thing, these people are beaten up. They're taken in by the police. We couldn't see them. We, could, we didn't know where they were. So the first thing was to reveal what was going on. So we had to run to the, uh, to the prison hospital and to find doctors in the prison hospital who, who were willing to report to us on the condition of, the, of, 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 of those three uh, people. So we needed, first thing was to reveal what was going on. And then we had to redeem the, the, the victims. At the same time, yeah, the regime strategy was to cover up. They put them in the car, took them to the, to the prison hospital, and, and, and hid them from, from, from the public side because they wanted to cover up what was going on. The second step was we needed to, and when we revealed their, their location and what was happening to them, we needed to kind of tell the people and tell the public who these people are and what fate you know, they encountered, why they were beaten up so badly, what was the, the story behind it. This third guy, who was, this fourth guy actually, who was intimidated, and uh, that, that, that was actually the, how shall I say, that was the origin of the whole incident, he actually managed to escape unharmed, which is kind of bizarre. And so he became like a, uh, he became like a wit witness to, to what, was, what was going on, you know. And, and he actually uh, gave the first-hand account to, you know, the origin of the problem and, and, and the incident. And so at the same time, the, the strategy of the, of the regime is to devalue the victim, the victims. And so let me read you very shortly uh, an article from the newspapers at the time about uh, this incident. The title is, Members of pro-NATO organization Odpor are mentally disturbed persons infamous for their criminal acts. This is like a state-run state, state uh, run, uh, newspaper. Momchilo Veljković, who was classified under code F22 at the ne neuropsychology department of the hospital in Požarevac, continuous demented psychosis. After an unsuccessful attempt to prove himself in political parties, became close to the extremist organizations. Radojko Luković, known in Požarevac as Luka the dealer, has been tried several times as a street foreign currency dealer. Nebojša Sokolović has falsely represented himself as a lawyer and his agency owes to the state 40,000 dinars. The arrested individuals, twice as old as their supporters from the pro-NATO organization Otpor, are widely known in Požarevac for causing disturbances. Opposition parties, in spite of clear facts, have politicized a case of an attempted murder in front of the Café Passage. So this is the devaluation. So they even had access to, you know, whether true or not, medical documents, and they were revealing that uh, to the public. So this is, this leads us, lead us to the next, to the next uh, uh, phase of our strategy, which is to reframe the whole thing. And this was very important, to reframe the incident as the epitome of Serbian problem. The, uh, I, I, I talked about it earlier. It's the country held hostage by one family. Irresponsible son, uh, very strong father, you know, and, 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 uh, and the institutions that are actually hijacked by, by this family. What the, what the regime is trying to do is reinterpret the whole thing. So pro-NATO organization Otpor, trying to, dis to make disturbances. In the end, declaring Otpor a terrorist organization. This is, you know, reinterpret the, the, the whole thing as, a, as, a, as a, our attempt to, uh, how shall I say, bring down the, the regime. So we then, you know, the next phase in the, according to, the, to this model is redirecting uh, 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 the, the whole, how shall I say, effort to further mobilization of the people. So we started mobilizing people. We started, you know, printing these posters and, and, and organizing people. And as, as the, the regime was fighting back, we also, you know, turned to other cases of, of of, of repression and try to kind of organize people around, around this. So Radojko Luković, one of the three, became the symbol of something that was, that was uh, much, much bigger. In the meantime, you know, they 
actually realized they cannot hide them in hospital for a, for a long time. So they started, you know, pushing to the official channels. Investigation started. The judge had to have a hearing. You know, after like I don't know how many days, they finally show up in public so we can see them. Uh, and uh, they're trying to use official channels to kind of put down the 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 this fire. And uh, in these official channels, uh, you know, of course, they, are, uh, they were finally accused and sentenced and they were sent to jail. And so there was nothing we could do. But what happened was that the first judge who was supposed to, to, to hold hearing, he refused to do it. Because he actually saw that, like, the documentation and everything. And this was, you know, he was even willing to, to risk persecution. He was dismissed, of course but no further action was taken against him, but he refused to do it. So this was a crack, a little crack. So we use this as a, as a, as a uh, uh, segue into our next phase, which was to, to increase resistance. And so increasing resistance was uh, our part of the strategy and declaring us a terrorist organization and organizing a mass uh, uh, campaign of arrests was the intimidation strategy of the of the regime. So I was like using this model, and you can read more about it in, in, in the E class. There are uh, examples there are, are from the Indian independence movement from East Timor. And there is another example there, which is not uh, so much connected with, the, with the, such a, how shall I say, liberation struggles. Uh, it's a uh, treatment of, of, of uh, 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 well, doesn't matter. Uh, but you can read about it. Uh, you can, I, I just use this model to, to interpret uh, this particular backfire incident. So let's, let's spend a few minutes just talking about you know, the conditions for backfire. Hmm? I have five more minutes. Yeah. Uh, conditions for backfire. Martin actually has two conditions. One, he says, is that, and we talked about it, action is perceived as unjust, as unfair, as, you know, excessive use of force, or, you know, disproportionate use of force. And so this is a condition for backfire, that, that people actually perceive this as, as something that, that, that is unfair in general. And the second condition that he uses, <laughs> I put one again. Uh, second condition is that uh, this information is communicated to relevant audiences, which is exactly what we did in, the, in, in this particular case. I would add uh, one more if I can. And that is that the movement has a capacity to mobilize and to counter despair. Because sometimes people can see this uh, action as, as unjust, unfair, excessive, disproportionate. It, it can be communicated to a wider audience and oh, everybody knows about it. But they just think there is nothing they can do about it. So they think that the government is unjust, that is brutal, but there's no hope. So despair is actually the biggest enemy. And if the movement, through mobilization, through actions that we did, in, in, in the case of Pozhera's incident, can actually mobilize people and fight that despair, that's uh, 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 like a condition I would add for successful backfire. And another example from Egypt, Khaled Saib who was uh, brutally murdered in prison and became not just the symbol of, of Mubarak's uh, repressive regime, but as we can see in this cartoon, he became the symbol of January 25th Egyptian revolution. As uh, this cartoonist put him holding Mubarak in his... So this was a, a, a backfire that actually is directly linked to the, to the fall of... of of uh, Mubarak. Okay, I don't have a freedom manual, um, but I have a little kit for repression management. And it's only it's only three pages long. Um, we have more. We have more coming, I guess. And I thought what I would do is actually we'll. Maybe we'll take a minute to have you just look it over because I knew we were going to be kind of pressed for time. 
And I'm actually just a sort of little add-on here. Yvonne is the main attraction. And um, so I'm a little add-on to, to sort of fill in a couple of holes. And, and what, one of the things that I've been uh, working on with my colleague Lee Smithy, we're, we're editing a book on the paradox, what we call the paradox of repression, what Brian Martin and others call it backfire. And um, so what, here are a couple of ideas that we had. One, the first one is to, to sort of riff on Irving Goffman's idea of impression management. All the world's a stage and everybody's busy managing impressions as we move through life, proffering certain roles, trying to convince people that we are appropriate to play these roles and so on. And then, um, so what we're thinking of is, is the idea of repression management, that one of the key tasks that we're involved in uh, uh, from the movement point of view is, is how to manage the impression, as Otpour did so beautifully uh, in many different instances, especially the one that, that Yvonne just uh, went through for us. So, there are, um, so I have, first of all, this sort of repression management, and I've turned to one of the most, what I thought was one of the most helpful ways of thinking about this is the framing literature uh, within social movement studies. Uh, the idea that, that uh, a movement has to figure out how to frame. And this is just kind of a, an example of one of the kinds of things, but I think one of the most helpful examples of one of the kinds of things that movements can do to try to manage the, the repression that they've, that they've received. Um, so we'll, we'll run through that a bit and see what kinds of questions and comments you have. I won't take time to touch on all of these points because we're pressed for time. The last, <coughs> uh, the chart on the last page is uh, a sort of adaptation of my uh, kind of master f intellectual frame. Um, that I, I actually have a, a, a kind of conflict, I call it a conflict transformation grid that I use when I talk about how to analyze conflicts and how to transform the conflicts. And it starts with Aristotle and it moves on through all the uh, literature of social movements and conflict analysis and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but so across the top, we also see, you can either see them as Aristotle's categories or as journalist questions, who, what, when, why, where, right? And then along the left-hand uh, column are different dimensions. Um, and, and what I've tried to do is if, if you think about what's happened with, say, an oppression, repression event. So repression has occurred, and what you want to do is have some way of kind of systematically thinking of what are all the options. How can you change what's happened? Right? How can you transform this event into something that's positive for the movement, negative for the people who repressed you, who, whoever they are. And so the idea is that under, in each of these cells, we could spend the next three days working on this. In each of these cells, there's something that can be done, right? And, and, in, and, in, and the idea is just in some cases, just sort of like case by case, in your own situation, you check and see, is there something that can be done in this place? Real briefly, the first dimension, the, across the top is pretty, is pretty obvious, although there are a couple of things I'll mention about it later. But first of all, what are, at the so social psychological dimension, the relationships between you and other people who are involved in the repression and in managing the repression. And this has to do, of course, first of all, between you and the sort of d direct agents of repression, like this, the police, the security force, whatever, but then also, who was it who told them to do it? And, and what were sort of what are all, who were all the people who were involved in orchestrating the repression, right? And, um, and, so, and because part of, the, part of the real joys of nonviolent resistance is that the, the, the options are endless, right? they're virtually endless. There's a much limited number of violent things that you can do to people than there are nonviolent things that you can do to respond to their violence, right? It all, it all depends on the conditions, that, and this, but especially the creativity of the people who are involved. And, um, and also, uh, one thing that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later um, is I, thi I think one of the differences between the violent and the nonviolent actions is that the nonviolent action <coughs> involves a different kind of view of the adversary. 
And this is especially true. It's not, it's not just you know, sort of getting rid of Mubarak or getting rid of Milosevic or getting rid of Bush or whoever it is you're angry at, because they're just a symbol of the regime, right? They're just, they're just a symbol. And as we know from Egypt, once they're gone, it's not over. And so there, there's a whole set of characters we're trying to relate to. And you, want, and you want to relate to them. And if you're relating to them with violence, you're setting up a barrier that prevents a lot of future possibilities. If you're re relating to them with nonviolence, and for Gandhi, this is a matter of, he, he called it separating the doer from the deed or the sin from the sinner. So you attack what they've done, not them as a person. You still treat them with respect. Now, this is not, not the easy part. Actually, I, I, I ran into trouble with this when I was trying to do a strategic planning session with some West Papuans one day, and the, and the first of the pillars of support in their strategic plan was the police and the military. Well, we got stuck on that one because al almost all of the West Papuans in the room had either been directly you know, tortured, jailed, uh, or their friends and family had been, some, some family friends murdered, uh, and so the idea of sort of reaching out to the police and the military was extremely difficult for them to think about. But if you look at the empirical evidence, like from Chiffon and uh, Stefan, I'm, I'm, mixing, I'm blending the two That's names, Chenoweth <laughs> and Stefan's <laughs> marvelous Why Civil Resistance Works, the evidence is it's often the defections that make the difference. Right? And uh, so you don't want to just you know, do violence back doesn't matter what your morals are. Um, the point is it's ineffective in terms, especially in the long run, in terms of building up what you want to have happen after it's over. And especially if you're in a situation where you're not trying to just bring down the regime, but you're trying to create some kind of change with people you're going to still live with after the, after the struggle is finished. The second dimension is the institutional. And um, and I'm a sociologist, so sometimes I would start with the institutional, maybe. What are the, all the array of institutions that are involved here? What did they have to do with the repression? How can they be involved in transforming the consequences of the repression? And finally, the symbolic um, or the ritual aspects of the situation, because sometimes um, it's some little thing that's really important to people that is more important than a, than a thousand other things that don't matter. Um, when, I'm, when I'm talking about this to my classes, I always say, I, I really wish that someday I could come in when I'm talking about the importance of the symbolic, I could come in with an American flag and put it in a bowl on a, in front of the room and set it on fire. Uh, I've never gotten the courage to do it. But it would show them how important the symbolic is, right? Uh, because sometimes it's those little things they they, they oftentimes become kind of lightning rods in conflicts uh, where all the energy sort of suddenly channels there. So if you can use, if you can transform the meaning of those key symbols within the culture, that's significant. So then, so then you look across the top under each one of those dimensions, what is it you can change um, in, in each one of those dimensions in terms of who the relationships among the various people, the pillar actors, right? These are the pillars of support, um, the major, the key institutions. But they're but they're all they're, they're all individuals. And again, this is another thing that the nonviolent approach I think involves is identifying the people you're struggling against as as uh, humans, and you're and you're involved in some kind of uh, of relationship with them. So. Um, let me mention just briefly then a couple of things about the, um, back to the, to the first page, um, this whole idea of repression management. I think there's some, some keys involved using people power, okay, first of all, to transform the structures. We've, all, we've already gotten this, right? So it all has to do with the exercise of power. And um, one thing that helps me a lot in thinking about these things is, Hannah Arendt, wonderful. Little, have you read Hannah Arendt's little book on violence? There's a New York Review summary of it. Um, New York Review of Books summary of it. But she says basically people don't use violence. Uh, viol violence and we sometimes we sometimes equate violence and power. But in fact, people use violence when they're losing power, 
and they're trying to ma they're trying to maintain it. And um, so so uh, people power is another is another form of power. We use that to transform the structures. And the second issue is the primacy of participation. This is the this is the bottom line of the Chenoweth and Stefan study on why civil resistance works. The uh, 323 cases of violent and nonviolent campaigns over 106 years. The the one the single biggest difference between success and failure is how many people participate in the movement. There are a lot of other things going on, but that's the one uh, the one sort of overwhelming factors. And so again, when people are dealing with repression, uh, it seems to me like it's important to remember that there are so many different roles involved in the movement, and and people should should become involved with where their skills and passions are, right? And so there should be some kind of coordination, of course, but there, again, there are, there are a thousand things that, that can be done. And finally, strategic planning, uh, absolutely. And, and the thing that always comes to my mind when I think about this, not just when James Lawson is sitting in front of me, is the, the scene in uh, Force More Powerful when they're, they're in the, the Nashville workshop being trained on what to do when they're being harassed. Um, and, and, and it seems like this is, this is a wonderful glimpse into the whole process, the importance of, of training and preparation prior to the event. And I think that also the cultivation of relationships prior to repressive events is part of uh, what's significant here. Um, let me... I'm trying to figure out what to talk about and what not to, because I want us to get to leave plenty of time for discussion. And uh, we only have half an hour left. So um, risk assessment, I think, is Im important. Again, some people got, are going to be uh, able to engage in more risk. This is bo both than others. This is both part of the, the sort of proactive planning process and then also after a repressive event has occurred in terms of what kinds of things people will do individually and, and as a movement. Um, so then the framing. There are basically three tasks that every social movement has to engage in as part of the framing process. This is uh, um, Dave Snow and uh, Robert Benford's um, uh, sort of uh, really fine analysis of the framing the framing process, which highlights the sort of cultural repertoire and cultural resources that are available uh, uh, to, to, to movements in this sort of side of, of movement mobilization. There's the diagnostic, the prognostic, diagnostic, what's wrong, the prognostic, what should be done, and then the motivational, how do you get people to do things? Right? How do you motivate? What are the sort of rhetorics of motive? So the diagnostic, um, involves linking repressive events with what's wrong with the system. Right? Using, and again, I love um, uh, John Paul Lederach has this, win has this metaphor about conflict. Conflict as a window. It's a great way of thinking about conflict. We can also use, apply that to repress repressive events as well. That when, uh, when a conflict occurs, if you see it as a window, it's revealing something that needs to be done. Right? Within the you, have a, you have a wall between you and the things that need to be done, and so suddenly a window appears, and this is what happens with repressive events. There's something about the event itself that exposes to people what's wrong with the regime and what needs to be done. Okay. Um, so you have to take advantage of the, the, the sort of participation advantage of nonviolent civil resistance as, as a consequence of that window. Then, you, one minute, you frame the movement goals um, so that the, 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 the goals of the movement resonate with the audiences you're trying to address. And there are multiple audiences here. The first audience, I would say, are people within the supportive pillars people within the civil service, people within the police and military, people within the educational, religious, and business communities of the context within which you're working. You want them to understand 
uh, what you're doing. And so you have to have a frame that addresses them and that links the problem with the repression with the problem with the system. The media, obviously, the adherents, bystanders, and potential sympathizers. Prognostic framing, what should be done? Again, um, what are the cultural repertoires and tools that are available in your particular situation? Uh, what are the things that make sense to people uh, you're trying to address about what needs to be done? And uh, then finally, motivational framing. Uh, there are a whole series of ideas here that I think are helpful. Frame alignment processes. Aligning the frames of the movement with frames that people already have. Cognitive frames that people already have. Ideas about meaning, about what's important, what makes sense, what's just, what's unjust. Uh, their vision of how their society or your organization or the corporation uh, should be. Um, finally, I would just argue uh, that it's really important not to lose track, and I've mentioned this before, but I'll, but I'll close with this, not to lose track of the post-conflict community building, right, so that whatever we do in responding to repression, on the one hand, there's a kind of tension here, there's a dialectic, and we have to embrace both sides of it. On the one hand, you want to say, wow, look how horrible they are, see what they just did, right? But on the other hand, we want to say, okay, after this is all over, we're going to win the struggle, and then we're going to live with these people, except maybe a, you know, the dictator may leave the country or something. But, but we're going to, most of the people we're struggling with, we're still going to live with them, and we have to rebuild something after it's over. 